Still not seven. <laughs> now that we were too far in the other direction. Yeah, well. <sighs> Never let it be said that we lean too far to the right. Anyway, hi everybody, I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast, and it is time for the beginning of our two-part season finale, the two-part virtue ethics throwdown that I know you've been waiting for all season. Yes, we've been not so subtly alluding to it as a possibility, and now That's it's... because Ryan is a filthy virtue ethicist. Yeah, I know. But, anyways, no, it's uh, the season finale, and we decided to do something a little bit special, try to do something a little special. And uh, so we thought we'd go with a little bit of a theme and uh, do some two-part action there because all good series tend to end on a two-parter. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's what we figured. But uh, so Ryan, Jim, for the entire season, you we I mean, also it's nice to finish this out with some real philosophy. <laughs> well, as opposed to the philosophy that we've sort of been puttering with and amidst other topics, but you are as I have come to understand it a consummate virtue ethicist would you say that you are in fact the living embodiment of aristotle maybe not the living embodiment i mean i am certainly white white um of european descent um i'm a man i don't think aristotle was white he was greek he was greek but at the time they were the important so what you're saying did you did you just live on the podcast draw an analogy between being white and being important yeah. Ryan doesn't speak for the podcast. I think that it's important to note that. No, no. Thank you for calling me out on it. Um, I was certainly care- careless with my language. But um, but no, I wouldn't say I'm the living embodiment of Aristotle. That seems reasonable. Uh, only because I think I'm not a true virtue ethicist. I am what I'm starting to call myself a cherry-picking virtue ethicist. <laughs> because we talked about it a little bit in a previous episode. But I tend to be very lax in terms of how I think of um, picking out uh, moral exemplars to to follow as like a paradigm or as a as a uh, an individual who exemplifies a virtue. Um, and we're going to talk about all that today. But first, yeah. icebreaker, Ryan, Jim, who is the person that you want to be like? If I had to narrow it down. Um, I would probably say I, I would strive to be a little bit like my dad or a lot like my dad. Um, just because a lot of a lot of the things that I, I hold, like as much as I'm lazy, I, a lot of my work ethic when I actually work, I would say derives from my dad and being self-sufficient. So, you know, it's important that you always work hard for your family and provide. Um, it's always important to, to be learn for yourself and uh, make your own way kind of deal. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know what? This might run counter to... Um, it, it, it falls a little bit within patriarchy, I'm going to admit, but the idea of kind of like my dad's a very stoic man and I do look up to that, that you know, like he doesn't... When, when he's upset, he doesn't really complain. He kind of holds it. And... and I kind of, I kind of like that. I'm gonna go on record there and say I kind of, I kind of like being that way. As much as it bothers Sarah, you know, she wants me to very much open up and be honest about you know that, things. That, it it's seems a, like a reasonable thing. It to seems want. like a reasonable thing, but um, for some reason, you know, when I think of my dad as being you know resolute and you just grin and whatever's whatever bad's happening, you grin and bear it, deal with it, and you kind of move on with it. It's very manly. I know it's very manly. It's perhaps not healthy, I, I admit. And it, like I said, um, especially in the context of feminism, I completely understand why that's a dangerous thing um, to impose on people. But I actually do identify and like that. So so for good or bad, I, I would say that I, I look up and kind of want to be like my dad. Seems legit. Jim, who would you want to be like or live up to or who do you look up to hank green and for those who don't know who hank green is (laughs) for those of you who don't know who hank green is you can see our podcast no no um hank green is one of the vlog vlog brothers he is of of hank and john green and hank green is brilliant I mean, and not only is he brilliant in the sense that he creates lots of new things, he encourages people to, to uh, use and, 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 and come up with new ideas and, and uses them in different ways. He's really smart. Um, he 
creates new businesses that create opportunities for other people, which is incredible. Um, but not just in a in a startup guy kind of way, because Hank is also he's, he's artistic. He writes music. He's he's really funny. He does vlogs, kind of like me. But at the same time, uh, he's also really compassionate. He has a he has a ten, like he he listens before he speaks, which is a wonderful trait to have. Um, and when he makes things, he he thinks about them a lot before doing it, and, which is interesting because. I will, especially in the wake of, in the last year or so, there's been a lot of YouTubers who have done some really problematic things, or, or invariably some really, some really super shitty things. Um, and this is not surprising, YouTube is very large, but I mean, when I say YouTubers, I sort of, I sort of think of the, the VidCon style YouTube community, people who do comedy and prank channels and music and things like that, as opposed to people who are, I'm not, I don't even want to name names because of people who do mean and terrible things on YouTube, because then you might go and look at them and they're, they're just monsters. Yeah, they're not really worth but, giving. <laughs> no, I, I don't, I, the, the few page views that I could throw them are still not page views they deserve, mm. but, and, and despite all of that, um, Hank tends to to rise above it. He doesn't have a lot. He doesn't have those incidents himself, because he does tend to think of others first. Uh, at least from what I know, I, I've never actually met Hank Green, um, but from what I have observed, and when those things happen, he is he is just as quick to call them out. He is not. He doesn't ball up inside that community or or, or put up balls. He's like, no, no, this thing that you did, you know, one of the things that that. Hank is in charge of uh, is VidCon, which is a big YouTube convention every year in California. And there are, because of the revelations of the last year or so, there are some people who are no longer welcome there. And, and he said, listen, as long as you keep doing this and as long as you keep doing it unapologetically, like this, this is not a space where we can have you because VidCon needs to be safe for everyone. And it is still, I mean, no space is safe for everyone, but the point is that they do their very best. Mm -hmm. And that is really cool. So Hank Green is my guy that I would really like to be with. Or be, 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 be with. That's, uh, we're not playing YouTube Would You Rather. We'll no. play YouTube Would You Rather in a different season finale. <laughs> but uh, the guy that I would like to be like. Um, and the reason why we, we, we talk about that as an icebreaker is virtue ethics has a lot to do with wanting to be like other people. Which we'll get to in a second. First off, what is virtue ethics? Like, what does that mean? Um, so, typically when you take first year philosophy and you're trying to wrap your mind around it, usually um, the, the quick shorthand way of understanding it is what would X do uh, is usually how it's cashed out. It's you find some sort of moral exemplar and you would ask what would jesus do what would socrates do and you ask that question because these individuals have some sort of inner excellence uh which in uh for the ancient greeks was arete um when it was brought into latin it was uh for virtues um what was the original latin for virtue do you know offhand uh, i'm pretty sure it's just virtus. yeah um, but, that's where virtue comes from. But they're roughly they're roughly equivalent in in the. There's probably some nuances between the original yes. Greek and Latin, but um, <laughs> but largely these individuals who you look up to embody these um, excellences, these virtues, um, and they live their life according to these virtues. Um, yeah, so and you, it gets cashed out in different ways. You find this first in in the work of Aristotle in his Nicomachean Ethics. Mm -hmm. Where he categorizes all of the virtues, and he dis he, he says that uh, what you are really after is eudaimonia, which is the good life, mm -hmm. and the good life for Aristotle is doing the right thing in the right way at the right time for the right reasons. And a person who has virtues is a person who does this yeah. all the time, and. To, to make a, a fine point here, it is you by doing these virtues, it it's like um, 
it's a little bit of a means to an end, but it's also an end in and of itself that it that's what leads to the good life. It's the good life is is on the face of it doing the right thing at the right time in the right place, but ultimately it leads to this concept of eudaimonia of happiness and in modern day it's a lot of times um, expressed as human flourishing. Yeah. Um, flourishing is a good word for it. Flourishing, yeah. Uh, so the the end goal is the good life, which can be happiness or flourishing. Happiness not in the pleasure seeking sense, but happiness in a, a little bit more of a broad, less tenuated sense. Yeah. Um, and then the the way to this good life. One one might even call it fulfillment. Fulfillment. Podcast link to fulfillment over <laughs> Ryan's face. But yeah. and the virtues exist. All virtues, almost all virtues, many virtues, most virtues, exist on a continuum. There's a line, and the virtue exists in the middle. So the, the example that, that, that is easiest to, to pick up out of Aristotle is courage. We understand that courage is a virtue. Being brave is something that is excellent. I mean, we can all think of times when we were not brave enough... Um, But we can also think of times where we were too brave. We were too brash and we became foolhardy. And so you have on one end, you have cowardice. On the other end, you have foolhardiness. And in the middle, you have genuine courage. Because bravery is a thing that you... I mean, so someone who's foolhardy is brave when they do not need to be brave. Mm -hmm. You're like, today I was very brave. I took the garbage out. Please congratulate. Well, and it could go even further than that. I mean, for Aristotle, um, when he was talking about courage, he was more than likely talking about martial valor Mm -hmm. of soldiers. So soldiers, and uh, actually I talked about this a little bit in the first chapter of my thesis. Um, There are certain jobs and advocations that require bravery. (laughs) Firefighting, I mean, besides the military. Obviously the military, you need to be brave. Yeah, but anything Um, that requires you to sort of put yourself in danger. Right, so firefighting, even being a doctor or a nurse, especially uh, as we're recording this, the uh, the, uh, global concerns around Ebola, right? So these doctors who are having to go and treat patients in some sense that can be putting their own lives in danger for the sake of helping other people. Mm-hmm. Like there's a certain bravery or there's a certain courage that is required of you in order to be able to do your job. Uh, and so courage sits in the mean or in the, the middle of either uh, of two excess or two extremes, which is either an excess or a deficiency. So you're either excessively courageous and you are so brash that you uh, run out, to, to face your enemy head on in, in military combat. If you're a firefighter, you rush into a burning building without any consideration of you know, whether or not it's safe for you to go or even practical for you to go. Um, if you are a doctor and you rush in to traffic to save somebody to you know who's been hit by a car without giving any consideration to yourself. And actually, you know, in first aid, that is something that you're taught to, to keep in the front of your mind. Is you know your safety comes first because you don't want to add to the problem. So if you are excessively brash without thinking and you just barge into a situation, uh, this would be a case where you are you are not being virtuous. You're not you're yeah. displaying the wrong level of, of courage. Similarly, if you if you hold back mm-hmm. when you could do something, you know in in battle you're you're the person who runs away or hangs at the back of the line or. Mm-hmm. Um, you are you're experiencing a failure of courage, a lack of courage, and you know, which which Aristotle calls cowardice. Which side note, um, being a conscientious objector is not the same thing as being as that's being, true. So if if in battle, you know, you do not engage the enemy because you do not uh, you do not wish to take part in violence. That's a different. That's courage, but displayed uh, in a different context. It's, it's not. I think Aristotle talks about that briefly. Yeah, like it's it's. It doesn't use the term conscientious objector. But right. That's just something that's easy for us to, to digest. Yeah. Um, but, and the, courage is sort of the easiest Aristotelian virtue to get your hands on. Mm-hmm. Uh, temperance mm-hmm. is one of the other ones. Is temperance is the idea that you should do all things in moderation. Insert comment about how moderation in moderation something something no. uh, here. Just... Yeah. We're going to edit that in. We're not actually going to edit that in because that joke is never funny. <laughs> but 
Uh, when you are temperate, you you know you don't drink too much, but you don't you don't not drink at all. You know you 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 drink the right amount. You partake in the right amounts of pleasure. You you don't take anything too extremes. Temperance is basically your ability to ride the line on pretty much everything else. Mm-hmm. Which is kind of interesting because you don't consume alcohol. I do not. And yet that we don't consider that to be a vice. Mm. Maybe in social search situations, but you know, whether or not We don't we don't consider it to be a vice, but but it if if I am at a party um where I am uh where lots of people are drinking and I am not, it's often a curiosity. Uh there are certain events that I that I simply don't participate in, like pub crawls and mm-hmm. things like that, where other people go and have a really good time. Uh, but in ancient Greece, pretty much anything that involves a good time also involves getting drunk, because video games won't be invented for another 2,400 years. Symposium. <laughs> yeah. Video game symposium, by the way? Write that down. <laughs> That's going to be a really great idea. Someday. Somehow. Okay. But, you know, so... I don't I, I don't go to those things anymore but but I am I am by I'm also not invited to those things I'm I am excluded by default on, by virtue of me not drinking mm-hmm. um, I, actually let's not use the words by virtue let's let's only refer to virtues yeah let's... just just for sake of but, but because I don't drink I, I I don't get invited to pub crawls and that makes a lot of sense because I don't really want to go to pub calls because I don't drink right um, I spend a lot of time hanging out in bars despite that but and I, I feel like this is a perfect time to talk about something that I really enjoy about um, uh, virtue ethics and something I touched on it a little bit in my thesis is one thing I like about virtue ethics um, that I felt was missing a little bit in, say, deontology is virtue ethics is often case sensitive with the individual because my level of courage and Jim's level of courage uh, or what what is expected of me for courage and what is expected of you for courage in certain situations are entirely different. Mm-hmm. So, for example, uh, in my thesis, I talked about four people involved in a burning building and what sorts of things we would say are reasonably expected of them. I didn't talk about courage, but I talked about um, we reasonably expect somebody to pull the fire alarm and notify the fire department. We expect the firefighter to be willing to run into the building, uh, assuming it's safe, but run into the building to go and save somebody. But we don't expect the average person on the street who is maybe there faster or is less encumbered by you know equipment or, or policy, even if you want yeah. to go so far. Um, but we don't expect the person on the street to necessarily have the same or display the same level of courage as the firefighter. Yeah, and if they do, we regard it as as her- heroic, like a, yeah. per- a regular person yeah. who saves another person from a burning building without somehow endangering, you know, firefighters in 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 a way. I'm not recommending that you necessarily do that. Yeah. But I mean, super erogatory. Yeah, there there the the the, the, the Strict philo- technical philosophy term is super erogatory. It's that acts that you you've gone above and beyond the call mm-hmm. of regular expectations and done something great. Mm-hmm. Um, that makes that makes perfect sense. I, and and I agree that that uh, so the other two th- theories of ethics, just to gloss over them very very quickly, um, that you learn in first year philosophy are deontology, uh, which is based in Immanuel Kant, and we'll talk a bit more about next episode. Um, and it's it's the notion that what we need are are rules that govern everyone, and you you follow the rules not just for the sake of the rules, but because the rules work, um, and because they work uh, universally for for all people in all places and all times. And consequentialism, uh, which has its roots in uh, British philosophers like uh, Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill. Yes, unsurprisingly, most modern schools of philosophy were in, or, uh, of ethics were invented by uh, European white men. Or at least the ones that we that, that we study in Western University. Yeah, Western canon tends to f- <laughs> yes. pull from very Weirdly. specific areas. But uh, and it's concerned with the idea that what you need to do is cause the greatest amount of happiness um, or well being to the greatest amount of people um, in any in any sort of given situation. And there's I am I am not giving these the nuance that they deserve, but that is essentially the the, the boilerplate definition. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so Aristotelian virtues, we've got courage, we've got temperance, but we've also got some weird stuff mm-hmm. like liberality, mm-hmm. which is your ability to spend money wisely mm-hmm. and munificence, which is your ability to give money away wisely mm-hmm. and wit, which is the only one I manage most of the time. 
<laughs> but there, there are there are all kinds of virtues because Aristotle's not just talking. Yeah, you know, he does he does narrow down moral virtues from what he would call practical virtues. Wit is sadly not a moral virtue; it's a practical virtue. Yeah. courage and temperance and wisdom are moral virtues they don't make you just good at being a person i mean being a virtuous person isn't just for aristotle it isn't just a person who is good but there it's also a person who's really fun at parties you know they're just buzzed enough that they're that they're they're happy but they're not sloppy drunk and they're not standing in the corner with their water looking grim trying hard not to feel alone in a crowd they're you know they're witty and funny, but they're not jerks, and but they're also not stupid. If it if you're having a hard time conceptualizing um, what kind of person this is, it's basically Oscar Wilde. Or yeah, think of Victorian era gentlemen. Like what was expected of the gentleman? The educated, the well mannered, the had the social grace and whatnot. Those those social virtues were kind of an extension on uh, what the original virtue theory was. Now, whether or not those... Or, I mean, I even, not even just Victorian gentlemen, but I mean, you know... Well, nice. Mary Shelley? Yeah. Oh, no, 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 yeah. I didn't mean to engender it. It's just um, the expectation. I mean, you can you can go back further and find other examples, but um, those, those kinds of social virtues, you know, uh, the raconteur who doesn't get drunk and... Has uh, it's just because I uh, I've been watching a lot of um, Jane Austen movies recently. Uh, Legit. Recently, I watched Sense and Sensibility, um, and but I mean it really, it really comes out in Pride and Prejudice, the idea of proper social decorum, mm-hmm. um, and you see like you know Mr. Darcy struggling with it, you know trying to be a good social person while also being intensely private himself. So, yeah, I mean. Uh... The, I think the ones that we're mostly concerned with here, as much as there are some some neat but weird Aristotelian virtues, are are the moral virtues, mm-hmm. uh, which are courage, temperance, and wisdom. Mm-hmm. And wisdom wisdom's a really thorny one, mm-hmm. but I, and and the hard part is, of course, is practicing these virtues. And it's easy to say that these are good things. Mm-hmm. And it, and and it's easy to understand them as, you know, the the a point that exists on two, on, on on sort of a mean of two points. So you're like, okay, well, I don't want to be, not I don't want to I don't want to lack courage, but I also don't want to have too much courage. And so whenever you feel like courage is called for, you just sort of go, okay, well, how much do I need here? And and is this really a thing where I need to be brave? And is what I'm doing really bravery? Mm-hmm. If you are not at risk, then you're not brave. But at the same time, um, if you take no risks, then you are also not brave. Mm-hmm. It's weird. Um, there's probably a gambling analogy in there somewhere. Although I don't know the appropriate amount level of courage for gambling, but there definitely is one. Yeah, and that was, and we'll, we might touch on this next episode. But there was um, a certain, um, there's a good criticism against it that there are some things, some traits that are just not a mean between anything. Like they're just categorically yes. bad. And Aristotle tried to deal with that a little bit in, in the Ethics, but. Um, and we're not to say that if you can find uh, an average or a mean between two extremes, it is always a good thing. Yeah, like, there there are lots of there are lots of averages that are that are probably not virtues. Yeah. I mean, five. Well, I was thinking the middle so, of ten. It's no, just five is not a virtue. No, I was thinking more like but, uh, but the difference the between never ones. killing somebody and being a psychopath. The the, the median <laughs> of of being a vigilante killer is not something that you want to ca- consider a virtue. Well, listen, I've only killed like five people. Yeah, everything's fine. Yeah, so I mean, it's my worst Batman impression ever. Yeah, I know you've been getting. I know. Normally, what's going on there? We'll have to we'll have to go back in the season and look at your best of and <laughs> best of Batman impression. Um, but yeah, so so yeah, just to bring the point back is not every not a, every uh, behavior or human yeah. characteristic is necessarily a candidate for being. Yeah, a and no, and no virtue ethicist is going to argue. You know, no. As much as I want to pick a bone with virtue ethics, yeah, um, the uh, the the they're they're 
virtue ethicists are reasonably sensible people. No. It's the last time you'll ever hear me say that, but it's true. Um, but, and so the way, the way that we facilitate this, I mean, it's hard to, to always find a norm and, and, and figure out, okay, well, is this the mean, is you establish a paragon. Mm. Uh, you know, I don't think that the, the, the people we admire that we talked about, uh, all of 20 minutes ago, I don't know that f- for sure that they are paragons, mm-hmm. but Aristotle was like, yeah, pick a paragon or several a person who embodies the virtues and just do what they would do. It's it's sort of... The, I will say that the neat thing about virtue ethics is that the practice is fake it till you make it. Mm-hmm. Eventually, you won't need the paragons anymore because you will have figured it out and you will just do what is right and then you yourself will probably be someone's paragon. Well, and to Aristotle, that's the only way to get virtues is by acting it. You can't have it unless you act it. So yeah, vir- virtues are not a thing that exists in your heart. Virtues yeah. are a thing that have to exist in your behavior. Yeah, yeah. So There are, uh, it was at Philip of Foot in mm-hmm. Virtues and Vices. Uh, I will attempt to link the paper below. I, I have a physical copy, but there, there, I, I'm not convinced that I can find a digital one that isn't behind a paywall. But I will look. Hmm. Uh, but Philip Afoot uh, talks about virtues as virtue belongs to the will, uh, but is acted by the body. It's not It's not a skill or an art or a thing that you practice. It is a thing that, that originates in your desire to be that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in order for it to be virtuous, that desire has to happen in the world. It is not enough to think brave thoughts. Mm-hmm. Um, it is, you, you have to act upon them mm-hmm. i mean in the same way that uh there's some there's some reference to this in in contemporary uh ally literature um and 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 feminist literature where there's a lot of criticism of people who uh claim to be allies uh, which is a which has become a a problematic term uh, because it is very easy to proclaim oneself an ally mm-hmm but still do nothing mm-hmm. to to actually help people. It's sort of a, a back-patting, cookie-seeking method. Yeah, it's not enough to just put a sticker up on your door. Yeah, no, you, you, you have to actually, like, be in... And there's some literature on active bystanders and, and things like that where you have to you have to actually take part. In the same way that it is not enough to simply know first aid. Mm-hmm. You you could you can stand there and think, yes, I, I, I know CPR, I could probably... You have to actually physically go and do it. And that is the hard part of of virtues, especially because virtues are more elemental. Like they involve being brave and being temperate. And yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it's one thing. It's it's like that person who's like, I don't want to get that drunk tonight, and then they just they get ridiculously drunk. Yeah, and it's not just you know being brave or being temperate. It is being the right kind of brave or the right, mm-hmm. showing the right kind of courage at the right time. Yeah. So sometimes it involves knowing when to hold your tongue and sometimes it involves getting in and getting, uh, getting dirty with the action. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's a time and place and whatnot. And it's really hard. It's really hard to adjudicate that on your own, That which is why often you kind of think about these moral exemplars as, as the example. And then that is supposed to help you, understand how to act brave so that or how to act courageous so that eventually you have the 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 virtue of courage and once you have it it's not like you can choose not to to do it if you if you can choose not to do if you can choose not to be courageous you don't actually have courage it's one of the weird weird it, things that's hard to wrap your mind around when you're I, studying I, I figured I, I i remember having this conversation in grad school and it, and it makes sense to me in the sense that you never want to be that person. I mean, ideally, for, for Aristotle and for most virtue ethicists, you never want to be that person who's like, man, I really could have done otherwise. I could have not been courageous or I could have betrayed a person or something like that, but I didn't. Mm-hmm. Go me. You want to be the kind of person to whom not being courageous or not, or, or, or not betraying someone's trust or something like that. Mm-hmm. Does not even occur to them. Yeah. 
And yeah. that seems perfectly reasonable. Like in the context of you, you would, if I came up to you and I, and you know, and you had just you know left left your your thesis with me or something like that, and I and I gave it back to you, I'm like, man, I totally could have just deleted your thesis, but I didn't. Yeah. You would that would worry. That's worrisome. Yeah. You want to leave your 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 work with someone who you trust implicitly because it would never occur to them. And it yeah. seems weird to think of it in the way that well, you could not do otherwise. But what it me- really means is just you 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 would never. Yeah. Um, yeah, the only way it counts is, like, it is not literally impossible for you yes. to do something. It's, yeah, it could have happened because it is something that could possibly have happened. To, but, to, to but, get nerdy, uh, yeah. do you remember the train job in Firefly? Uh, There's, I, at the very, yeah. the very end of that episode, uh, the sh- you know, as, as uh, Captain Reynolds, and is, he's bringing back the medicine, and he runs into the sheriff. And the sheriff says, yeah, you know, a man uh, in the situation that the universe, the galaxy's in, a man might take work where he can find it. But once he understood the nature of that job, he, you know, he's got a choice. And Nathan Fillion looks him in the eye and says, no, I don't think he does. Mm-hmm. You know, is, is, as soon as he understood the implications of his actions, he could not do otherwise but return the money for the job. And then send it and, and and return and return the medicine. Like there was no for him, there was no other option. And that that is that is the kind of of moral strength yeah. that that both Aristotle and I think lots of contemporary people admire. And that is when we look for one of the things that we look for in paragons mm-hmm. is that kind of moral strength. We right. don't want a paragon who's like, uh, you know, I could, I could. I could, yeah, I might not. No, you want a paragon who's just like, this is what we do. No. no you don't wake up in the morning and be like, no, not today. Today it's, it's you know. I don't I'm, feel I'm, like it. Yeah. Superman, do you want to go and save this city today? I don't want to. Yeah. I just want to lay here in bed. <laughs> well, Superman gets up and saves the city. Yeah. So, when it... it just to, to bring it back, that might be a, uh, something, if you, especially if you start studying a little bit about uh, virtue ethics. It's it's a hard concept to wrap your mind around initially. But there's some helpful links down in the down below in yeah. the show notes. Yeah. So just keep in mind that constantly acting a way, and then once you have the virtue, you don't act another way. It's just it becomes a part of who you are. It's you know you don't yeah you in, you internalize it. Yeah. I mean, and that's the sort of contemporary way of thinking about it is that what these things are are traits that you really want to internalize to, mm-hmm. to, to put it in sort of life hackery blog terms mm-hmm. i mean you don't want to it's in, in the same reason that you don't want to have to think about productivity or creativity you just want to do them and no. and if you spend a lot of time doing them eventually you won't have to think about them anymore mm-hmm. and so this this kind of brings up uh, a section of virtue ethics that it's it's another hard pill to swallow that you have to realize for a large part of your life, if you do try to be a virtue or if you try to embody the virtues, your whole life is essentially going to be full of failures mm-hmm. of you not being, you don't have the virtue. You don't act yeah. virtuously. And that's, that can be an uncomfortable truth for, to, to sit with I people. Would, I would even go one further. I would, I would say that you will never really truly in like Aristotelian virtue ethicist ideal, you will never, ever have that. I would be, I actually, I, I was about to say that that I would, I would be amazed and and admiring of a human being who was staunchly courageous and never experienced any doubts. Mm-hmm. But the truth is that I wouldn't be. I would be terrified of that person. And. <laughs> And, and like like we worry about people like that. We don't. We admire them sometimes, but also they are a very great cause for concern. And the thing is that that's okay. Yeah. Like like the I mean there's an, the idea in ethics is there's a you can set a normative ideal. It's a goal that you could that you should strive toward, but you might never ever reach. Yeah. But it doesn't matter because you can get closer and closer. And you can compare yourself to that goal, and the fact that you could never reach it doesn't matter. You know, it's like if I if I my goal is to run the hundred meter in 
seven and a half seconds. I don't... That's not physically possible. Yeah. Well, logically it might like, be possible. Usain but... Bolt yeah. can't run the 100, the 100 meter in seven and a half seconds. And he is the fastest person on the planet. Yeah. And he just can't do it. But if I keep trying to do that, I will get faster and faster. And I can take steps to do that. I can train. I can practice. I can learn new running techniques. I can find runners uh, and coaches that uh, I admire. I can read their work. I can I can travel to them and, and, and learn from them. I can learn from runners in the past and see who's done what and, and, and how to take care of my body so that I don't get injuries and and things like that. I can seek support from, from people around me and practice. And, and, but the, the, the number one thing I have to do is practice. I have to practice all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I might be able to run the 100 meter very fast. And, and, and that is a thing to be proud of because what I'm looking at is my improvement, not my ability to hit that particular goal. Yeah. So that can be, um, that can be a, um, a defeating part of it is you are not ever probably going to exemplify a virtue. And then the other part that's really uh, sad is you might be courageous, but you also might be a drunk and have absolutely no temperance. Yeah. So you're, it's almost like, um, it's almost like each, each um, uh, is a exponential kind of failure in terms of, yeah, and that's the, and, and and there is this notion that in order to have one virtue, you have to have all of the virtues. Yeah, because it is not you. You are not virtuous if you are courageous but intemperate. No, if you are a brave drunk, uh, or a you, you would be admired for other things if you were a brave or a, or a temperate coward. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean. There are lots. There are lots of human beings in the world who might be best described as temperate cowards. Mm-hmm. Um, I am sometimes one of them. But and I think it all is, drunks it is, tend to be brave in their mind. Yeah, <laughs> they're they're not exactly that's, prudent. That's foolhardy. That's yeah, they're, foolhardy. Yeah, they're not I mean, prudent. But they're right, and, and, exactly. so you're supposed to exercise wisdom to, under, to understand uh, how these all fit together. And but that is is I think where we will leave the to be continued. For the season finale, because next next time we'll see the dark side of virtue ethics, the flawed bits, the bits that the virtue ethicists don't want you to know. Well, they do actually want you to know because they spend a lot of time writing papers about it. Yeah. Um, like that's sort of how scholarship works. Yeah. So they're not really hiding it at all. No. But were they to hide it, they would. Except, yes. except they weren't. Well, they wouldn't because they're virtue ethicists. All that and more next time on Concept Crucible Podcast. I'm Jim. And I'm Ryan. And we're signing off. Stay virtuous. Whenever whenever you bring up temperance, there's some in, in a philosophy class, there's somebody in second year who's a smart ass and is like well, if I'm supposed to have all things in moderation, doesn't that mean that I should only take moderation and moderation? And you're like, sure. Oh. Okay. I know, because I was that second-year jerk-off once. <laughs>